very good morning to everyone. Um, so without taking uh, much, because I have only 15 minutes and lots to talk about. Today my talk is on astigmatism uh, and cataract. So toricity can present to us in various forms. It could be as high as 23 diopters having a lot of irregularity or a regular one. But as a beginner, it can seem daunting to promise hematropia in such patients, but there is a method to this madness. We know that, now we know with studies, that three in four eyes today have astigmatism, which is more than 0.5 diopters. And with cataract surgery becoming a refractive one, it is time that we change our thresholds and update it to the current trend. Now, various studies have shown that the residual of more than 0.75 diopters in a monofocal lens and 0. more than 0.5 in multifocus can result in a significant blur and therefore cause your patient to be unhappy. And this threshold may again change depending on whether you are dealing with a with the rule or an against the rule astigmatism. Again, a good toric outcome will make sense if your spherical error is to the minimum. So it's a good idea to look at your own results in a non-toric patient and probably optimize your eye oil constant because that will help you to get a good outcome. Now, astigmatism should be looked at quite systematically and this protocol helps us do that. So let's look at each of these steps in detail. So once we know the threshold that we need to correct, we should also know the ones to exclude or to treat. A teresion can induce a cylinder up to 23 diopters, which, can't, which cannot be corrected by any toric lens, but a simple excision will just give us a better cylinder to work with. Or a case of an anterior basement membrane disease, where the problem is an abnormal basement membrane, which was giving an irregular astigmatism, which you cannot correct by a toric lens. But a simple PTK will then change that, leaving us with probably a surface which is so regular, you don't need a toric lens. Now this is an interesting case to discuss because it shows what can happen if we don't treat the underlying disease. Now this patient came for a cataract surgery opinion. She gave a history of some dry eye, occasionally using some lubricants. She underwent a lens star as well as a varion. It is a good idea to look at multiple data points and that's what we did. Now the keratometry values from these two machines were not too different. But when we looked at the quality of scans, you can see that the reflections are not so precise and some are probably more dark than the others. Now, her keratometry on the topography was irregular, which was prominent on the tangential map. But surprisingly, the amount of astigmatism for her left eye was recorded at 0.2 versus the two diopters, which was recorded with the other instruments. So, all the three machines showed a very different value for her left eye. Now, interestingly, we had a scan of this patient from two years back, and the cylinder in her left eye had increased from 0.5 to almost 2.5 diopters. Now, this change can only be explained by something that's going wrong with the ocular surface from which the data is recorded. Now, although her symptoms were minimal, she had several clinical signs suggestive of a mixed type of dry eye. And when we scanned her epithelium, to both our dismay, this was how it was. It was thin, irregular, and worse in the left eye, which rightfully showed those eccentric feelings. The eye trace showed increased higher order aberrations from both the cornea and the lens. And this proved that cataract surgery alone was not going to solve her problem, but it could in fact worsen her surface and therefore her vision. So this cascade of scans began because we had a high index of suspicion when two or three instruments gave us different values. And if we would have neglected those red flags, then a wrong intraocular plapa would have been implanted, resulting in a refractive surprise. So treating the dry eye and then operating is the way to go. So once now the surface is treated, we have to get data from it. And there are several machines which give it, which we will have a look in some time. But what's more important is to validate that data. So most of us have our technicians do this step and uh, you know we see the first scan that comes our way and we believe it. But that assumption is wrong. The machine is giving us a lot of red flags and we need to look for them. So for example, a missing data point here in this IOL Master 500 or a uh, irregular LED reflection in the eye of master 700 or a slight incorrect positioning or a skewing of the eye could give you a wrong axial length as well as KD day. Dr. Hill has given us a validation criteria for different machines and for lens star, we have to look at the standard deviation readings for the K1, K2 and the steep meridian and over here you can see that they are both out of the acceptable range. And when you go and look at the individual data, you can see that the machine has stamped one reading as incorrect. Now you have to manually omit that and see if your standard deviation improves. In this case, it did for the K readings, but not so for the axis. So this again warrants a repeat scan for a good visual outcome. And the website has given different validation criteria for different machines. And it's a good idea to print these out just for our, ourselves and the technicians to use and follow. Over here, both the corneas will give us some data points. But one would be incorrect. So the bottom line is to look at our raw data in whatever form and then validate your readings or you will be working in a wrong 
surface giving you a wrong outcome. Some machines are specific, for example, in IOMaster, given by uh, one article said that if the seat meridians of the eye line up with the 0, 60, 180, 150, then the IOMaster works well. But if the seat meridian is at a 30, 90, or 120, the machine may have to do a lot of interpolation. So it is always a good idea to take measurements from multiple machines and not just trust one. So a combination of your optical biometer, an autorefractometer, and a topographer is a good basic combination to begin toric practice with. Dr. Hill proposed that we use one instrument like a lens star or the IOL master as the primary instrument for measuring the magnitude of the cylinder and then to use the topographer as the primary instrument for measuring the steep meridian or the axis of the cylinder. So in this side, the lens star will give us the amount of astigmatism which is then confirmed on the, with the topography. Then the axis of the topographer must be within 5 degrees from the lens star to validate the amount of cylinder. And then of course a third instrument just helps to reconfirm the same data. Now another way to use this data is to just integrate all these scans on a barotronic calculator and it will give you the median vector solution using any or all your machines. We now know, thanks to Dr. Koch, that there is a huge variability in the posterior corneal astigmatism and the way it is found in our population. And we can no longer rely on machines which extrapolate. So why is the PCA important? Let's just have a look. For the same amount of anterior corneal curvature, if the posterior cornea is steeper, the total keratometry of the eye becomes less. We know that the posterior cornea is steeper vertically and it therefore acts as a minus lens vertically and as a plus lens in the horizontal meridian. So to simply explain, it reduces our width of the astigmatism and increases our against the width. But the reality is little more complex than that. As both the anterior and posterior cornea contribute to the total corneal astigmatism, resulting in a totally different corneal astigmatism which may not follow the previous one. So that kind of complicates things. So to solve this problem, what we can do is use mathematical models which incorporates the PC or we can directly measure the posterior cornea via any of these methods or even with intraoperative aberrometry. Now one would have thought that a direct look at the posterior cornea would be more accurate, but as of today, no machine is able to do that accurately. The current research also tells us that mathematical models work better than a direct measurement in a normal cornea. They also found intraoperative aperimetry is no better than a current generation formulae. Now the reason why the direct measurement is unpredictable is because the posterior cornea is a very difficult surface to identify and to quantify. And in the current day, we have no machine which is a gold standard with which you can validate or compare. But sometimes we've seen, after doing all of this, that even the mathematical models may not work well. And that is because these formulae use population-based prediction algorithm. They use the anterior corneal astigmatism and the post-operative refraction to predict for the PCA. And this may be affected by various factors like an IOL tint or even others which are still very unknown. The latest version of Barrett-Torrey calculator has included these factors fortunately in their algorithm and theoretically it should work better than the other ones. So today it is a no-brainer to choose the barrett -toric. and if you use it from these websites then the latest updates are accessible to us. You can use the integrated K for calculation, use the predicted or measured PCA option. As we know in measured PCA is a better form to use in an unusual cornea like a queratoconus or a post-refractive surgery. And then we have to remember not to use the total corneal uh, power measurements with these mathematical models because then you would account for the PCA twice. An interesting thing to see here is a, you know, a study done by Oliver Findel and group which found that the natural crystalline lens as well as the IOL tilts anteriorly more on the nasal side and that could act like an against the rule astigmatism. We definitely need further studies but a day will soon be here when we will adjust this for the toric lens like a PCA beforehand and then decide what toric power to implant. So the calculation of toric lens is still very much evolving. The next step in our algorithm is to find our SIA. When you look at a patient's astigmatism postoperatively, it is a sum of his pre-existing corneal astigmatism and the astigmatism that you have induced while performing the surgery and now we know that it is quite variable. It is typically represented on a double angled plot showing the white with the rule on the right half and against the rule on the left half. And the variability can be seen here at, in this plot given by Douglas Koch. You can see that this is a plot showing 50 patients SIA which is scattered everywhere although his incision and size has been constant. So a mean 
was in this case of around 0.4 and the centroid value of 0 0.07. So if you would have considered a, a value of 0.4, you would have a 0 0.0, you would have almost landed in an error of 0.4 if you, had, if you would have considered the mean. So this is the importance of the centroid value. Now knowing that it can be quite variable, it is a good idea to find your own SIA if you are operating with incisions larger than 2.8. And if you can't do that or if you are going less than 2.8, you can just put an SIA of 0.12 and then do your calculations. Now the story is slightly different for unusual corneas and it is always better to use these special formulae with a direct measurement of the posterior corneal astigmatism instead of the predicted one. The toric outcome finally depends a lot on the toric alignment and we all have various methods. Initially it is better to double check with marking and doing two methods. And once you have consistent results, you could stick to just one which is best in your hands. The new Barrett dual axis marker seems promising which can be used with the Toricam app and of course the image guided methods are very helpful. This was interesting to see, shown by Dr. Hill, that there is a unique way of making a permanent capsule or excess landmark for Toric IOS and probably some of the uh, companies using Femto may make this in the future. I am not sure how uh, strong the excess would be but this would be an interesting thing to do. A lot of things can then finally lead to residual astigmatism and we have to be meticulous to follow each of these steps correctly. These errors, remember, are most significant when lower amount or lower power of astigmatism are corrected. So this was what I ended up with, a residual astigmatism after a toric vivity implantation. I was supposed to put it at 95, the next day when I saw it had rotated to 75, which is almost 20 degrees away and had lost almost 70% of its initial power. So what then you do is you go to the Barrett RX formula and the astigmatism fix to find a solution. Now what was interesting here to see is that I had induced an SIA of 0.8 in this case and the calculators both told me to dial the lens to 103. So that kind of reassured me that both of them seem the same. So it also does give you an exchange of uh, 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 option of an IOL exchange but I chose to rotate the same lens. And I did that after two weeks and the patient next day was 6 by 6 and was suitably happy. The final step in your toric journey is a bit tedious but I think necessary and which is to track your toric IOL results. The ACRS website provides us with this double angle plot study and it tells us to uh, see our post-operative residual astigmatism which will be a good guide to see if you are hitting your targets well. Before I summarize, I must mention the role of LRIs in our current practice today. With the femtosecond laser, the LRIs are more predictable and can definitely be used even with multifocals when the patient may not afford a toric multifocal lens. The LRI calculator.com can give you the NAPA down and field nomogram, it gives you the arc length, the thickness and tells us the predicted residual astigmatism that we you may uh, land up with after doing the LRI. This was an interesting case because we combined an LRI with a multifocal lens where the lens couldn't correct the entire cylinder. This patient had almost four diopters of cylinder. Barrett suggested us to use a T9, which corrects 3.8 at the corneal plane. But the highest toric in pan optics available was T6, which would leave us with a residual of 1.6 diopters, which was then corrected with an LRI, and the patient had excellent results. So as you begin your toric practice, it is better to go with these corneas rather than the unpredictable one. But that doesn't mean you can't tackle those two. Once you've understood the concept, you can dabble a bit in those post refractive post RK cases, which, which truly are an enigma to us all. Now, this eye had an irregular astigmatism up to 10 diopters after a 12 cut RK and AK. So, we planned for a toric lens for her. This cornea was so irregular that the lens guard nor the variant could pick up any readings, and somehow the eye will master gave us some readings which corroborated well with the topographer. The EKR showed a flat graph. And directory calculator recommended to use T9, which still would leave behind the residual cylinder of four diopters. Now the ASCRS post RK suggested we use a 29 diopter lens. We decided to implant a 31 T9, considering she had 12 cut RKs. Now what's interesting to note here is that her higher order aberrations, when the pupil was 3 millimeter, were significantly high both internally and in the cornea. But when the pupil size were reduced, both the internal and the corneal higher order reduced significantly. So we decided to do a pinhole pupiloplasty along with the procedure and the post-op results were quite gratifying with better visual quality and obviously a reduced refractive power for her. So in the end, I will say that our understanding about astigmatism is still quite evolving and having said that, if we choose our cases well, we can have a very good visual outcome. 
I think the role of Turbo Guide HBRT in the future is, is upcoming and it will definitely help us to make the surface better. And when we choose whether we want to do toric lenses or not, it is a good idea to look at the predicted post refract residual astigmatism instead of the astigmatism that is shown on your eye master to decide whether you want to implant a toric lens or not. And finally, I would say customize each lens for each case and trust your instincts because then you're sure to get a good result. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Tanvi, for an extensive talk. You've covered it so meticulously and not left any stone unturned. Any questions from the audience? Uh, I would like to ask you for the case in which you did, did the multifocal along with multifocal toric along with an LRI. Uh, would uh, keeping the LRI at a later date would have been a better option according to you, or you choose to do it right away at the same sitting? So considering that the patient wanted spectacle-free vision to begin with, with which she went for a multifocal lens, telling her that we'll do one procedure now and then something else later, would then maybe then I would have convinced her for a monofocal uh, toric, you know, because it would have corrected the entire thing. Uh, if there is any residue uh, expected, would the panel want to take it up right away or consider it at a later date having added up all the vectors coming from the surgical induced astigmatism and then having your final uh, astigmatism, would that be a better option or would you still want to go ahead with, at the same setting? <laughs> I, I think even the pack probably Ramamurti may say, uh, tell us, sir, that do you do a uh, surface guided treatment for those residual uh, patients, maybe, you know, and for that age group, and how are those results? Because I always feel that the dry eye may be one big factor which may stop me from doing it for them, and how will they take those type of surgeries? Um, you're talking about. Uh, Post operative residual, it could be a cylinder, or even a spherical. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I do a lot of biotics, you know, wait for a period of about three months. What that particular case you are talking about, we are dealing with about three doctors and we had about 4.5. And as we all know, LRA is inaccurate science. You are only debulking the astigmatism and not aiming at refractive accuracy. So what you did, I agree with that in the sense that you are trying to bring it down. And subsequently, there was a significant amount of cylinder left over, assuming that the cornea can take a little laser vision correction. You can offer that uh, three months later to hit the target. But uh, I would always come, if I had to do a LRI or a laser aquate keratotomy, I would do it on table. And if there is a residual error, deal with it later on. I have one question to the all panelists. Uh, are you all using TK or 2K normal? Uh, TK is in uh, routine cases. Well, as Tarmi very nicely brought it up, I think uh, there was a lot of interest in total keratometry when the concept came about. Now since we have it, we use it. But then I won't invest on it just because I need the TK values. It's been even uh, Graham Barrett shows that uh, as far as the regular run-of-the-mill corneas are concerned, using the mathematical formula also works quite well. It's only in the case of keratoconus, in the cases of antigenic keratectasia, where the, the relationship between the anterior cornea and the posterior cornea is disturbed. The direct measurements should scores over the um, what the assumptions that are made in the mathematical formula. So having said that, whenever I do use a toric intrac lens or a toric intrac lens in a post-refractive surgery scenario, I definitely would prefer a total ketometry. But for the usual cases, I don't think it makes a big difference. So take home message, normal case works very well. So many messages. Uh, he's asking that uh, with the case where I saw the calculated SIA was 0 0.8 in my case where the toric eye was uh, rotated. So I actually had operated in three weeks back. This is my case which I re-rotated two days back and yesterday he came for a good post op outlet. So it's been three weeks after that I did the calculation. So yeah, it was uh, against the root? The cylinder? Yes, it was against the root. So and it actually it induced more against the root? Yes, uh, not it was oblique, sir. At 30 degrees is what? Ah, yeah. So that's where it becomes a little unfair. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And probably a lower refractive error. It was just a 0.75. In fact, the calculator told me to exchange it with a higher toric power. So I had implanted a T2. It told me put a T3. Uh, 
obviously made no sense for me to take out the lens. It was just 20 degrees off, so I then re-rotated it. And surprisingly, it's 6 6 unaided. Mm. So. Uh, Dr. Swami, 0.85 is scary. So I think the smart toric they can customize it for you, but in Alcon platform they don't. Uh, we request Dr. Varika sir to give the bouquet to Dr. You call please. Thank you Dr. Tanvi and Dr. Varika will stay on for his talk on uh, trifocal aisles. To be or not to be by the host. <laughs>